we are beginning with slide 12 uh, from chapter the chapter 43 on um, PowerPoints. There we go. All right. Um, so this is slide 12. And um, in this chapter, we're looking at interactions between organisms. It, this chapter is mainly on communities and interactions among living things. So we're going to talk about predator-prey interactions. Predation is defined as one living organism, which is the predator, feeding on another, which is the prey. So if you look at it that way, um, from that definition, parasitism is a type of predation. A parasite is the predator and the host is the prey. Parasitoids are organisms that lay their eggs inside a host. So some parasites actually lay their eggs inside of a host. We call them parasitoids. The parasite itself is the one that lives on the host. Um, okay, and then population density of the predator can be affected by the prevalence of the prey and vice versa. What you typically see with predator-prey relationships and their um, populations growth, uh, population increases and decreases, is you see them fluctuate um, in relation to, so the predator population uh, numbers will fluctuate in relation to the prey, and the prey numbers will fluctuate in the relation to the predator. They kind of help to keep the other uh, population in check. So we don't see a steady state like we did, you know, with the um, population graphs of the um, paramecia. What we see is a series of peaks and valleys. So one year you may have a high number of uh, predators and the next year, you know, the number may drop off and same with the prey. But what we do see is a pattern where the predator populations will follow the prey populations. So example, a very famous example is, at least in biology, <laughs> is um, the, the snowshoe hare and the Canada lynx. Those um, populations were monitored for many, many years so that um, the ecologists could study how the populations were changing in in relation to each other. So it wasn't just the number of links. The number of links was not the only factor in this, the population cycling. So here's what they saw. Let's just look at um, starting in 1987 and we'll jump ahead a few years and just look and see. Um, we'll just look at peaks to start with. So we've got the graph of the snowshoe hare um, population and then the graph of the lynx population. So snowshoe hare is in red, lynx is in blue. You can see a picture of them down here. Here's the lynx and here's the snowshoe hare. So um, we look at around, I guess, 1987, a little bit later than 1987. We have a peak in the population of the snowshoe hare, and that correlates with a low in the population of the lynx but we do see the lynx population rising. And as it rises, as the lynx population rises, when we see a peak in the lynx population, more lynx, a little while later, we start seeing the snowshoe hare population fall. Um, but what does that do? That causes the lynx population to drop off as well. Because if they're not, if, if the lynx population rises so much, they're gonna consume more of the snowshoe hares. And then that's gonna cause the snowshoe hare population to start dropping. And when that population drops, then the number of predators um, cannot stay as high as it is because they don't have enough food. So the prey population numbers do drive the population of the predator. So we notice here, let's look in between um, 1995 and 2000. So this is probably like 1998. In 1998, we see a peak in the snowshoe hare population. Just a year later, a little around a year later, we see a peak in the lynx population. 
but that can't last because once that lynx population peaks, then the number of hair are gonna go down. So we see that drop off in the hairs, and then we see immediately the drop off in the hairs, we see a drop off in the lynx. And it really looks like to me that we're seeing the trends in the hair population just before we see the same trend in the lynx population. So it's like when you look at this graph, it seems that the population of the snowshoe hare is driving the population of lynx. You know, whatever happens with the hare is what's going to happen with the lynx population a year later, you know. So, um, but what we don't have on here is are we monitoring the food of the snowshoe hare? Because that's going to have an effect on the snowshoe hare population too. All we're looking at is the population of snowshoe hare and the population of lynx. We're not looking at any other factors. But if this is all we do, we can see whatever trends happen with the snowshoe hare. We're watching the same trend a few years later, one year to a few years later, with the lynx, which is the predator. So it's the prey numbers that are driving the predator numbers, um, at least from that study. All right, um, prey defenses. Oh, and I'm sorry, one other thing I want, because there's another thing to learn, and that is, what if we didn't have a predator? If we didn't have a predator, and the snowshoe hare population was just able, allowed to just go out of control, then what are they going to do? They eat vegetation. They're herbivores. So the snowshoe hares are going to eat all the vegetation, and then the snowshoe hare population is going to die off. You know, so we need big predators to keep the other populations in check. They kind of keep each other in check, the predator and prey populations. But we need those big predators. And we there's been many times in nature where we've had to reintroduce big predators like wolves to areas because we were seeing that the prey were eating all the vegetation and killing all the vegetation. And then that just affects all the organisms um, in the ecosystem. You know, it causes a lot of snowball effects, you know. So prey defenses. These are uh, defenses that prey have to avoid being eaten. <laughs> Mechanisms that thwart the possibility of being eaten by a predator. First of all, the prey have heightened senses so that they can know when the predator's coming after them and they can, they can uh, get away. Prey also tend to have speed. Sometimes they'll have protective armor, protective spines or thorns. They may have, like in the case of uh, those little lizards we call skinks or anoles um, that are very common around where we live. They may have tails or appendages that break off, so they can grow them back later, but for the time being, that enabled them to escape a predator. They, a lot of prey have chemical defenses. Camouflage, and we're gonna talk about camouflage and warning coloration. Um, and mimicry. But camouflage helps the prey avoid being detected by the predator. Warning coloration. Um, bright colors which warn the predator that I'm, I'm possibly poisonous. Um, sometimes you have mimics that have warning coloration and they're really not poisonous, but because someone that looks very similar to them is, it still uh, fools the, the predator. Some have structures that cause the startle response. Uh, for example, a lantern fly with a false head that it makes it appear to be bigger, a bigger animal than what it is, might startle its um, predator enough that it won't go after it. And then you have flocking behavior, and this happens a lot. Um, spring box um, are one example, but flocking behavior, um, behavior where a group will get together and um, try to protect each other. You know, that happens in um, some of your grazing animals. It happens in birds. You know, they all just get together in a big group. They're more protected than if they're alone. 
All right, so here's some pictures of anti-predator defenses. If you're a fisherman or if you know any fishermen in your family, you know what this is, picture A. This is a flounder that has uh, camouflaged itself so it's hard to see on the bottom of the um, ocean. So um, they, they are a flattened fish and they flatten their bodies um, against the sand and they're camouflaged so that they blend in and they're very difficult to see. Um, that's why people tend to go flounder gigging at night. And you, of course you can catch flounder with a rod and reel, but a lot of people go flounder gigging um, and catch them with like a, a gig, which is like a spear. Then we have warning coloration in this frog. This frog probably is poisonous. Um, the, these bright yellow and black is a very popular color um, to signify you know, that I am poisonous, don't eat me or you will be sorry. You know, so that's a defense. And fright, this is um, a false head on this uh, lanternfly. And um, that makes it look like a more terrifying creature than what it really is. So let's talk about mimicry. This is when one species resembles another species that possesses an overt anti-predator defense. A lot of examples are that one species members, uh, resembles another species that is uh, poisonous, you know. So we have two types of mimicry. You do need to know the difference. There's Batesian mimicry, then there's Mullerian mimicry. In Batesian mimicry, the mimic lacks the defense of the organism it resembles. An example of this is the king snake mimicking the coral snake. The coral snake is poisonous and its coloration signifies I am a coral snake, I am poisonous. The king snake is actually a good snake. We like having king snakes because they help us with the rodents and they're non-poisonous. Um, I remember years and years ago, I mean, it's literally been over probably 20 to 20, it's probably been 25 years ago. It has been, I know. Um, I taught biology class in a school where um, there was a, a shop in the school and they would have a problem with snakes and they would try to capture the snake and bring it and see if um, the biology teachers could identify it, you know, and tell them how to get rid of it, that kind of thing. And um, they did that because we told them not to kill them just because they looked like coral snakes. If it was a king snake, they didn't need to kill it. And um, so we, we weren't snake experts, but we did have some uh, pictures to look at. So we would identify, and most of the time it was a king snake and not a coral snake. And not that we wanted to put it, put it back in the shop, but we definitely didn't want to kill it, you know. So um, <laughs> that's, I just think about that whenever I, I, when I saw this example, I thought about that. But, um, but it, it's, um, they do look a whole lot like a coral snake, that's for sure. And that um, protects them from, you know, predators like, you know, hawks and owls and uh, predators that would want to kill them and eat them. Now, if it's a Batesian mimic, that means that it is not necessarily poisonous. It not, does not have the same defense as the organism it mimics. But in Mullerian mimicry, the, the mimic shares a protective defense with the species that it mimics. So, for example, the bumblebee mimics the yellow jacket. They both have similar black and yellow um, coloration, warning coloration, and they both have a defense, a stinger. So um, that is a Mullerian mimic, okay? Um, and what we're seeing here is <clears throat> a bumblebee in picture A, a longhorn beetle in picture B, and then a yellow jacket in C, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, D is the bumblebee. A is just a fly, and my grandchildren um, love insects. I don't know if they got it from me or if it's just all kids, but um, they'll be scared of these little flies sometimes. And, and, you know, I have to tell them they're not going to hurt you because they, they might look like a bee, but they're not. They don't have a stinger. So this fly is a Batesian mimic to the bumblebee. Um, but the bumblebee is a Mullerian mimic to the yellow jacket. And I'm pretty sure the longhorn is also a Batesian mimic because they don't, they don't have a, 
I know they don't sting. Um, so baits in, they mimic the other species, but they don't have the, the defense that the other species has. Mullerian, they're mimics and they have the same defense, okay? Now for symbiosis, we'll go over the three types. It's a close association between two different species over long periods of time. They even will evolve together in a process we call co-evolution. But the close relationship can be of three types. It can be parasitism, commensalism, or mutualism, and that's what we'll talk about in our next recording.